Tonight, Professor Rebecca Schofield, professor of history at the University of Idaho, will explore the political realignment of the 1970s and 1980s through several of the women who acted as foot soldiers of agitation on the right, as they capitalized on, yet also rejected, the gains made by second wave feminism. Professor Schofield is an assistant professor of 20th century American history at University of Idaho. She holds advanced degrees from Harvard University, but more importantly, she has a bachelor's from Willamette University, where I also happened to get my degree. Um, her fascinating research focuses on the history of gender and sexuality, the American West, and popular culture. Her current book project, titled Outriders, Rodeo at the Fringes of the American West, analyzes how participating in rodeo has served as an inclusive force for marginalized communities over the 20th century. I'm really excited. Um, thank you so much for coming tonight, Professor Schofield. Let's all welcome her to the first Fettuccine Forum. I'm very short, so I'm going to pull this down. Is this loud enough? Can you all hear me? Nice, great, excellent. Um, so I actually grew up in Emmett, Idaho, just right down the road, um, which is very exciting for me to, A, be able to come back to my home state to, to teach at the University of Idaho, um, but also to come down uh, to Boise whenever possible to see my family and friends. And I would like to thank uh, Brandy Burns, Bob Reinhart, and Mike Iverson, as well as everyone at the Department of Arts and History here in Boise. But I would also like to thank all the students who have been forced to attend my lecture. Um, if it makes you feel any better, my family was also forced to attend my lecture. So you're not the only ones who had to be here tonight. But I really appreciate everyone coming out on a fairly rainy evening for Southern Idaho um, to sort of talk about uh, this longer history of conservatism and women. Um, so as um, Professor Reinhardt was saying, a lot of my research in the past has focused on the history of gender and sexuality. Uh, my BA and my MA are actually in Japanese studies, uh, and I wrote my master's thesis on the acrylic nail industry in Tokyo and aspects of uh, gender race um, in that setting. While I was there, getting my nails did for research in Tokyo, <laughs> wasn't a bad gig, um, I walked by a fashion shop called Rodeo Clowns in the middle of Shibuya. And they were selling tiny jean shorts and cowgirl boots and flannel shirts to um, Japanese teenage girls. And I had this moment of, huh? I have traveled the world to get away from Idaho, and it has followed me to Tokyo. So I started doing my PhD research on um, sort of the image of the American West, how this image has been uh, used by people like Ralph Lauren in the fashion industry, but also by Ronald Reagan in the political sphere, um, and also how women have interacted with this over time. So this topic that I'm going to talk about tonight actually isn't one of the sort of main uh, focal points of my own research. This really came out of uh, teaching and my interest in part um, about women that I grew up with. So, also I'm going to drink a lot because I'm thirsty. I'm also pregnant, so if you see me touching my belly, I'm not being weird. I'm just mitigating kicks, so sorry about that. Um, so, I grew up in Emmett, Idaho on a, a small cattle ranch, and I grew up around a lot of women who were sort of fiercely independent, who dug ditches, who blew snot rockets, who cursed a lot. Love you, Mom. Um, and yet, these women who often had to navigate um, the persistent separation of male and female labor in, in the ranching industry and in farming uh, communities rarely identified themselves as feminists or saw themselves as part of a larger political movement uh, around women's rights. As I sort of moved on into uh, academia, I noticed that this was particularly strange because 
women, like my mother and other women I grew up with, um, sort of held very deep, consistently libertarian ideologies. So, um, sorry, mom. Uh, you know, my mom kind of distrusts banks a lot and really thinks the government should stay out of her pocketbook. But she is also one of the most ardent defendants of Roe v. Wade that I know. And part of this came out of the idea that small government should stay out of your pocketbook, but also out of her and her daughter's uterus. And so this became very interesting to me as I sort of looked at the political movements in late 20th century America and noted that the Republican Party really welded together an economic libertarianism, an idea about deregulating the economy, while at the same time focusing on moral interventionism, sort of having um, a lot of regulations around people's bodies, who they could marry, those sorts of things. So how did they bring together these two seemingly uh, inconsistent ideas and make a successful sort of political movement. So as I started looking into this, uh, more and more scholars are dedicating attention to how incredibly crucial women were in this movement, making sure um, that you know, women were the ones hitting the beats every day, handing out flyers, picketing, um, knocking on doors, making sure sandwiches were made, uh, making phone calls, direct mailing, all of these things that had been used successfully by the political left in the 1960s were being reworked and redeployed in the 1970s and 80s by women on the right. So uh, this is incredibly important as we think about today's current political moment, right? When we look at the idea that 52% of white women voted uh, conservative in this past election, it's important to understand how this is not anything new, but indeed a continuation of a longer historical trajectory. So uh, today I'm going to sort of address this central question of how and why did women participate in this really crucial turning point in American politics, the rise of the new right, um, and how does this play out in the ways in which we think about women in activism. So I titled this lecture, Mom and Apple Pie, which was a popular slogan by anti-ERA um, advocates like Phyllis Schlafly. Uh, they would say things like, we're for mom and apple pie, because this really drives home the centrality of maternalism and the rhetoric about uh, being mothers as a central part of political activism for women on both the left and the right. So, like any good historian, I'm going to start my lecture about the 1970s. In 1795, <laughs> just give you a real brief 200 year trajectory. So, as we see in this painting, uh, motherhood, particularly what is called Republican motherhood, became incredibly central to the ways in which uh, sort of elite white women are being imagined at the turn of a couple centuries ago. Um, previously, when we look at portraiture from sort of colonial America prior to the revolution, women's paintings were often sort of solely focused on fertility. Uh, so they would be shown with things like grapes or flowers. They would be draped in really um, sort of luxurious silks and, and uh, beautiful garments. And as we move towards the revolution, this is replaced by um, an emphasis not only as, as what do I want to say, not only women as child bearers, but child rearers. So women are increasingly painted with their children, sort of in these active uh, roles of mothering their children. And what is so important about this is this sort of form of maternalism will become the, the way in which women gain entree into politics throughout the 19th and 20th century. Roles as mothers allowed women to have sort of moral authority to speak on political issues because they framed themselves as the mothers, as the raisers of future citizens. So they could uh, agitate for their own education in order to be able to educate their children better. Uh, they could even agitate for the vote. Now, as we get towards the late 19th century, we're just gonna skip 100 years. It's fine, guys, don't worry about it. Um, 
There is a focus by women's clubs uh, to reform the damage done by unbridled capitalism in the Gilded Age, sort of late 19th century. And you see women entering into these suffrage debates. Now, anti-suffrage uh, advocates used the notion of motherhood to urge for women to not have the vote, right? Uh, so as you can see from these postcards, um, the idea that mom has left the home, she's uh, disordered the, the uh, traditional household by leaving uh, her ill-equipped spouse uh, to deal with squalling children uh, while she is out protesting and uh, being inappropriate. Now, this is important, too, because, I mean, if we think about Mary Poppins, Mary Poppins only had to come into the household, right, and fix things because the mom was a suffragette. When I was young, I thought, like, the mom was dead. Like, she just doesn't exist. Um, nope, she's just busy being a political advocate for women's votes. Um, and Mary Poppins sort of has to step into that role uh, and reorder the household. But at the same time that sort of motherhood is being used against women's ability to vote, it is also being used to actively advocate for women's political participation in America. So uh, this is framed around the idea that women are sort of naturally inborn with an impulse towards social uplift, um, towards uh, reform, be, you know, making orphans and prostitutes and poor people's lives better with the vote, that they will naturally lift American society up. Of course, the suffrage movement and the temperance movement, the sort of prohibition movement, are tightly welded together. Um, and people like Theodore Roosevelt actively used the notion of um, the good mother to advocate for female suffrage. So, for instance, in uh, 1912, Teddy Roosevelt said, the service of a good mother to society is the most valuable economic asset that the entire commonwealth can show and is of infinitely, infinitely more worth to society than any possible service the woman could render by any other and necessarily for, uh, inferior form of industry. Motherhood must be protected and the state should make the security of the mothers its first concern. So this is essentially saying that women should be given the vote because they are mothers. They will, uh, he goes on to say that mothers would uh, hold um, men more accountable and make them, they would pass stricter alimony laws and those sorts of things to ensure that men are fulfilling their duties while remaining loyal to the household as the sort of core uh, piece of, of the uh, unit of American society. So as you can tell by uh, this lyric, these, uh, what do I want to say, the sheet music, um, no man is greater than his mother, no man is half so good, no man is better than the wife he loves, her love will guide him, whatever beguile him. Uh, women gave us Abraham Lincoln and Sherman and Lee and Washington and TR and Edison and um, Woodrow Wilson, the good double dubs. Women gave us all those great men and therefore should be allowed a voice in the polity. Now, this eventually became persuasive enough uh, to get women the vote, um, but it also what we see sort of across um, Western Europe and America, when women are given the vote, instead of sort of voting for a lot of social uplift, there's usually a re-entrenchment of traditional hierarchies as women are not a monolithic block of humanity, but instead tend to vote along the same lines of religion, race, socioeconomic class, um, and every other um, category as the men in their lives. And what we see is that this really galvanizes a lot of uh, conservative movements in the 1920s and 30s, particularly things like anti-communism in the United States. So in uh, 1927, organizations like the Daughters of the American Revolution, who had been some of the foremost vocal um, advocate for things like child labor protection, start to reverse course and say things that things like child protection um, or labor protection 
would essentially be the spread of the red menace into American society and that the state should have no say in uh, what age children go to work that should be entirely left up to mothers. By the time we get to the mid-century, uh, maternalism is most often deployed in defense of segregation, particularly uh, for white women. So what we see is a shift in maternalism away from being the mothers of all society, uh, lifting up people who are less advantaged, um, and focusing more on community protection, uh, being able to identify the social other and protect your children and your neighborhood against those threats. So um, what we see in the sort of early 20th century, mid 20th century moment is that things like war and depression and war again has increased the value that the American citizenry place on very hardy, pragmatic, tough women. Women who can navigate their families through these hard decisions of depression and war um, and come out the other side having protected their children. So we see this in World War I when you have many conservative mothers uh, uh, agitate for the draft saying that if uh, we don't institute conscription then only good white men will go to fight and um, lazy immigrant men will not and then all of the blood that will be shed is, is native blood and we'll end up with a racially mongrel nation. So pacifist mothers who had really used their, their um, maternal uh, clout to say we're protecting the entire world's children from slaughter suddenly are cast as bad mothers who have turned their children into weaklings and cowards. So we see this rhetoric reiterated. Now, as we actually get to the 1970s, uh, it's important to keep in mind what the political parties looked like. Uh, as we come into uh, the mid-century, a lot of the moderate, uh, what we refer to as the liberal consensus um, of the post-war period, a lot of the moderate parties actually don't look that different from each other. Um, so very famously, um, Kennedy and Nixon, uh, which was the first televised, inter uh, televised debate, People talked a lot about how their positions on issues didn't differ that much. What differed was that Nixon was kind of ewy. <laughs> he very much decided, he made a poor makeup choice. He, had, he was a very hairy man apparently and he decided instead of shaving before uh, the televised interview to use something called like lazy shave and it was essentially like cake makeup to put on over your five o'clock shadow and that melted off during uh, the debate and people were like why is he so sweaty and a monster um, and Kennedy sort of came off looking very suave and intelligent and people who actually listened to the debate on radio said that Nixon won and people who watched it on television, television said Kennedy won. Um, but in a lot of ways, the sort of uh, moderate um, Democratic Party and the moderate Republican Party didn't differ that much. Obviously, the Democratic Party is still built of the New Deal coalition um, of, of white working class people, people of color, uh, and generally people trying to uh, support the expansion of social programs. But what is most important to remember is that in the early 1970s, even the late, you know, sort of late 1960s, right up till Reagan, it was not apparent that the Republican Party would become the party of anti-ERA, anti-choice, and anti-LGBTQ rights. That was not apparent. In 1972, a Gallup poll found that 68% of all Americans believe that, quote, the decision to have an abortion should be the decision solely of a woman and her physician. And a greater proportion of Republicans, 68%, uh, believe that than Democrats, 59%. And there were many, many Republican feminists uh, who pushed very hard for the ERA. So as we see in the 1960s, the political parties start to realign. And women really drive this realignment. Of course, we have everything from the Vietnam War, civil rights, uh, second wave feminism, uh, the counterculture that is persistently uh, seen as attacking 
uh, traditional white masculinities, attacking the home, undermining uh, the sort of religious structure um, of the nation. And this is what becomes very concerning to many women who uh, sort of locate their identity in, within that family structure. So um, we see a lot of the times, and a lot of what I've written on, has been the use of things like the cowboy as a kind of masculine um, image for the new right, for male politicians in the new right, to appropriate and brand themselves as this new uh, ultra-masculine America that's going to um, rise up in the Vietnam or uh, rise up in the Cold War and put communists back in their place and end um, a lot of the sort of movement that has been made through civil rights and feminism and regain uh, that uh, strength that used to quote unquote defend um, American homes. So with this maternalism in mind and the way in which uh, the parties are being sort of ripped apart on both sides, as we see with the 1968 Democratic Convention, uh, where you have people like the Yippies uh, nominating their own candidate for president, Pegasus the Pig, um, and you have people protesting in the streets about Vietnam, and Demo obviously the Democratic Party is who took us into Vietnam. Um, you have the same movement happening on the right, where you have the far right battling moderate Republicans for control of the party. Now, Phyllis Schlafly was born in 1924 in St. Louis. She was raised during the Depression, and she actually saw her father uh, go unemployed for many years, watched her mom sort of step into this role of the breadwinner and how much that was agonizing for her father. Uh, her family was staunchly anti-New Deal. They perceived all social programs to be uh, part of communism and sort of the infiltration of the Red Menace into America. And she was able to attend a private high school. And at this private high school, uh, it was a place where they gave grades for female deportment uh, and really sort of inculcated uh, that image of the proper woman uh, in Phyllis Schlafly's mind. She graduated at the young age of 20 with a BA from uh, Washington University in St. Louis um, and received in 1945 a MA from Radcliffe, which was Harvard's all-women's school at the time. She would eventually earn in 1978 a JD from WashU. So she became involved in politics immediately following the war. She was a staunch segregationalist, which at the time was often framed as protecting the freedom of white parents to choose uh, who and where their uh, students went to school with. Uh, in 1964, she published A Choice, Not an Echo, which helped Barry Goldwater secure uh, the presidential nomination over the moderate Republican Nelson Rockefeller, and it sold three million copies. So she was a true conservative in uh, an increasingly moderate Republican Party. Uh, most of her uh, pet projects were around things like national defense, anti-communism, um, and small government. So after supporting Barry Goldwater's very unsuccessful bid, um, presidential bid, she sort of became pigeonholed in the Republican Party as part of the nut fringe, right? And the Repo Republican Party felt like they needed to move away from um, these types of people. So uh, she actually, in 1967, attempted to gain control of the National Federation of Republican Women, which was sort of the auxiliary, uh, female auxiliary to the Republican Party. And uh, when she lost that bid for control, she blamed her loss on illegal voting practices by her opponents. And in her book, Safe Not Sorry, she actually made some pretty amazing statements <clears throat> about the Republican Party. She said, the Republican Party is carried on the shoulders of women who do the work in the precincts, ringing doorbells, distributing literature, and doing all the tiresome, repetitious campaign tax, the tasks. Many men in the party, frankly, want to keep women doing the menial work while the selection of candidates and policy decisions are taken care of by the men in smoke-filled rooms. Sounds fairly feminist. Um, and uh, she went on to say that in 
her, they recognized one who could not be neutralized or silenced and who would fight for women to express their ideals in matters of policies and candidates commensurate with the work the women do for the party. So while she lost the presidency of the Federation, she created uh, sort of her own grassroots base. So the Phyllis Schlafly report started out with a circulation of 3,000 people sort of overnight. She kind of gained prominence within the party as a straight shooter who was not going to be silenced by the establishment. But it wasn't until five years later in 1972 that she would find the issue that would propel her to national prominence. <clears throat> so as the movement we sort of collectively call second wave feminism emerged around a myriad of interests, one of the most uh, important issues was the Equal Rights Amendment, the ERA. This had been around since the 1920s, um, but it had passed the House in 1971 by 354 to 23, and the Senate by 84 to 8. It was supported by Richard Nixon, Gerald Ford, Jimmy Carter. It was lobbied uh, by first ladies like Betty Ford. It was supported by the AFL-CIO, the League of Women Voters, the National Education Association, and women's magazines from Red Book to Good Housekeeping to Cosmopolitan published very positive um, articles on what this amendment would do for women. So, it was sort of assumed that this would uh, be passed very quickly and, and uh, ratified very quickly. However, in 1972, uh, once Schlafly sort of sat down with some of the literature, she became convinced, like many post-war women, that what this amendment would do uh, is strike down any protections that women had legally under the law. It would also economically um, undermine women's uh, dependence on men. It would force them to become their own breadwinners uh, and allow uh, men to escape sort of monogamous marriage and their duties as fathers. Uh, feminists, she argued, hate men, marriage, and children, and they are out to destroy morality and the family. So part of the ERA, she explained to her readers, um, meant that women would be able to be drafted. Uh, any special protections for women, including rape laws or labor laws, would be lost. Uh, and alimony, child support laws would disappear and men would not feel obligated to support their families. So by October, she had started STOP ERA, which STOP is actually an acronym for Stop Taking Our Privileges. And this actively sort of strove to include a lot of evangelical and fundamentalist Christian women who had previously not been politicized. And her newsletter went from a circulation of 3,000 to 35,000. But within this sort of imagining of the ERA, sort of her rhetoric around the ERA, she also is particularly committed to a very classed version of America. So she says in part of why uh, the ERA is dangerous to women is because they have the financial benefits of chivalry. She says women are a privileged group uh, because we are the beneficiaries of a tradition of special respect for women which dates from the Christian age of chivalry. We are lucky enough to inherit the traditions of the age of chivalry. In America, a man's first significant purchase is a diamond for his bride. The largest financial investment of his life is a home for her to live in. American husbands work hours of overtime to buy a fur piece or other finery to keep their wives in fashion and to pay premiums on their life insurance policies to provide for her comfort when she is a widow. That's like... That makes a lot of assumptions, right? That, that like you have money to buy a diamond ring, that, that you own your own home. Uh, this is a, a vision of American femininity which did not actually track onto the fact that most women had worked at least partially even after being married, um, that women of color had to, had to uh, face segregation laws that did not allow them to buy homes, um, that there was an entire other swath of uh, female humanity out there that had not sort of experienced this very uh, middle class vision of American femininity. So 
uh, at the 1977 National Women's Conference in Houston, which was a federally funded event brought, um, in, brought about in part by Gerald Ford's support, Schlafly and other anti-feminists organized a highly successful counter-conference, the Pro-Life, Pro-Family Rally. And this really breathed some life into conservative women's movements and helped funnel particularly label, uh, labor and funds towards socially conservative candidates, making sure that things like ERA opposition became part of a Republican candidate's must-have list. Uh, this put the uh, New Right Coalition, um, sort of directly responsible for the defeat of the ERA, um, which unfortunately only gained 35 out of the necessary 38 states to ratify it. And it sort of successfully organized women around this core ideological idea of the protection of the home uh, and women's roles as mothers as a privileged role that needed to be protected. It also utilized the tactics of the left, like picketing, boycott, direct mailing, uh, to successfully rally women on the right. Now, a lot of um, feminist activists at the time did not like Phyllis Schlafly. She was very good at sort of needling her opponents into uh, making uh, pretty outlandish and, and uh, interesting remarks. But they also acknowledged her great strengths. So for instance, uh, Karen DeCrow, who was the president of NOW in the mid-70s, says, I think what Phyllis is doing is absolutely dreadful. But I can't think of anyone who's so together and tough. I mean, everything you should raise your daughter to be. She's an extremely liberated woman. So alongside Phyllis Schlafly, um, Mil uh, Mildred Jefferson was working as one of the core advocates um, for anti-choice. So uh, Mildred Jefferson was born in Texas in 1926. She was the only child of a public school teacher and a military chaplain, and she graduated summa cum laude from Texas College in 1945. Uh, when her family moved to Boston, Massachusetts, she earned a master's degree from Tufts in 1947. And with the assistance of a scholarship, she pursued a medical career. In 1951, she became the first African-American woman to graduate from Harvard Medical School and the first woman to intern at Boston City Hospital. She also became the first woman employed as a surgeon at Boston University's Medical Center. So she became a ardent uh, right to Life movement organizer in 1970. She helped organize the, uh, groups like the Value of Life Committee, which was a non-denominational grassroots organization that really focused on uh, literature and uh, spreading their message on a grassroots level. And she would go on to found the National Right to Life Committee, um, which is made up of about 3,000 local chapters. Uh, she did that in 1973. So she was particularly interested in medical jurisprudence and medical ethics. So she was uh, sort of more broadly interested in everything um, like protesting against euthanasia, human cloning, uh, and embryonic st uh, stem cell research. So what really sort of launched her to national prominence was her relationship with the Republican Party and particularly President Ronald Reagan. So she described herself as a Lincoln Republican um, and uh, arrived um, at things like the 1977 rally alongside Phyllis Schlafly to sort of create anti-choice as a core Republican issue. And she also in 1981 went before Congress uh, for, to urge for the passage of a law defining uh, the beginning of life at conception. And she really did see abortion as a, a form of, of murder. Um, she said the uh, obstetrician and the mother are becoming the worst enemy of the child um, and that the state must be enabled to protect the life of a child born and unborn. Now this is incredibly interesting, right, because she is actually urging for the expansion of state power, which is supposed to be against the small government ideology of the Republican Party, but fits in well with the sort of moral conservatism that is arising in the new right. So uh, she described women who chose abortion as blinded by an all-absorbing selfishness and described 
quote, the woman who willingly demeans the nurturing instinct and tries instead to deny or to cancel or to destroy her own unique biological capabilities creates a new model of female being, one who isn't changed into a man, but somehow never quite grows into a woman and becomes, in a metaphysical sense, a little bit less than human. Now, she herself never had children, and this is a way in which that sort of reduces all uh, of female kind down to sort of biological mandates. It renders women who cannot bear children, who choose not to bear children, um, or who choose to terminate pregnancies as subhuman, neither man nor woman. And much of her rhetoric is really grounded in the idea of being a woman and having that moral authority and seeing herself as a mother encouraging a nation of mothers to protect children. She said, at once I am a physician, a citizen, and a woman. I am not willing to stand aside and allow uh, this concept of expendable human lives to turn this great land of ours into an exclusive reservation for the perfect, the privileged, and the planned. So as particularly a black woman and a scientist, she's really drawing on a much longer history uh, that really saw women of color as the main um, victims of uh, forced termination and forced sterilization throughout American history. And there was a very sort of real and visceral uh, fear that uh, legalizing or liberalizing abortion laws would uh, reinvigorate a long history of eugenics. You know, the Nazi party didn't just like come by eugenic laws, right? They were bred out of American and British science in the 1910s and the 1920s as America established eugenic boards and decided who uh, should be able to have children or not. So speaking at uh, Schlafly's pro-life, pro-family rally in 1977, Jefferson was able to harness this position uh, uh, through her gender, through her race, and sort of make an argument for scientific maternalism and scientific protection. Now, Ronald Reagan personally credited her with changing his mind on abortion. Like many other Republicans, Reagan didn't really have a firm position on abortion prior to meeting with Mildred Jefferson, um, and he said that he was grateful to her for changing his mind. So on the one hand, uh, Jefferson and other pro-life activists are trying to ensure that federal funding is not being funneled towards um, anything uh, that is sort of seen as uh, socially liberal, but at the same time, they're, they're sort of uh, arguing for an expansion of state power. Now, this can also be seen in Anita Bryant's uh, work against the gay community in uh, Florida. So, Born in 1940, Bryant's a sort of slightly younger generation of mothers within this movement. She was a starlet from a young age. She became Miss Oklahoma in 1958 and was the second runner-up at a Miss America pageant. She sort of was a mid-level pop singer with several uh, top 100 hits. Um, but from 1969 to 1979, she became the spokesperson for the Florida Citrus Community uh, Commission during which she became an outspoken force for the Save Our Children campaign. So in 1977, Bryant appeared at a public hearing in Miami, Florida before the Board of Commissioners of Dade County to debate an ordinance that would prohibit discrimination against uh, gay, and lesbian, uh, gay men and lesbians in the area of housing, uh, public accommodations, and employment. Bryant claimed her right to control, quote, the moral atmosphere in which my children grow up and insisted that the state support of gay civil rights infringed upon her rights as a parent. She declared that God gave mothers the divine right to reproduce and a divine commission to protect our children and our homes, businesses, and especially our schools. Uh, children were endangered at home, at schools, um, in part because she asserted homosexuals cannot reproduce, so they must recruit. And to freshen their ranks, they must recruit the youth of America. Appropriating civil rights rhetoric and conflating it with the rhetoric of child protection, these anti-gay activists described their own investments as, quote, the civil rights of parents to save our children from homosexual influence. So similar calls for protection of children had been used during massive resistance and anti-busing rhetoric uh, to ensure that the, the sort of freedom of white parents to send their kids to whatever schools they wanted 
um, operated as a bedrock of the uh, new Republican Party. So while Jefferson was calling for the state to sort of expand uh, protection of unborn lives, Bryant and other anti-busing and anti-feminist activists uh, urged for the complete control over one's own child, that the state had no right to influence who these children uh, had social contact with, attended school with, um, and particularly fears about sexuality, about uh, biracial sex, about same-sex relationships held a very distinct position in this maternalist rhetoric and the grassroots conservatism of the 1970s. So, uh, just as a side note, uh, the gay community in Florida fought back pretty hard. She was one of the first people to be pied, um, like she got a pie in the face on TV. Um, and uh, gay bars across the state and across the nation actually boycotted orange juice. And instead of serving screwdrivers, they served a, a Anita Bryant, which was a vodka and apple juice. Now, she was married to a fundamentalist Christian at the time, and this really uh, helped her gain a lot of play from people like Jerry Falwell, uh, who was helping bring that evangelical uh, fervor to this new right movement. And Jerry Falwell actually quoted her uh, when he sent out some fundraising letters in the 80s. He would say, please remember, homosexuals don't reproduce, they recruit, and they're out after my children and your children. However, Anita Bryant actually divorced her husband, and when she did so, uh, she, she ended up on the outs with both the evangelical right and, of course, the left. Um, but while her sort of political star faded pretty fast in the 90s, the um, ordinances that she helped keep in place that allowed for discrimination in places like Dade County had long-lasting effects. Uh, two, three decades later, uh, so it was not until uh, 1998 that the anti-discrimination legislation was able to pass in Florida, and it wasn't until 2008 that Florida allowed adoption by gay couples. So in defending her own right as a parent, she ensured that um, other people were not allowed to have uh, children of their own and raise them. Now I just want to end by briefly touching on a woman who sort of existed outside of this far right, Sandra Day O'Connor. Uh, Sandra Day O'Connor uh, would become the first woman appointed to the Supreme Court under uh, President Ronald Reagan in 1981, and she was known as a moderate Republican uh, and became a, a crucial swing vote in the later years of her tenure on the, uh, on the Supreme Court. Now, Unlike these other women, she was not sort of a spokesperson for a very specific issue, um, but she was the product of sort of larger um, forces shaping both the left's and the right's efforts with women in the 1960s and 70s. So for many people, just having a woman in the halls of power was a victory, and uh, she was really there, of course, because of of this uh, long-standing tradition of feminist activism, like. Uh, her uh, counterparts, like Phyllis Schlafly and Mildred Jefferson, she was very highly educated. Um, but what Sandra Day O'Connor really brought to the table was this image of the cowgirl. So she was born in Texas in 1930, and she spent much of her childhood on her family's Lazy Bee Ranch in Arizona. And she drew on her rural upbringing um, in order to frame herself uh, as the sort of rugged individualist, um, as a cowgirl, and she narrates a lot of her po political positions through her girlhood in the American West. So she was a skilled subsistent hunter, uh, she was an avid horse lover, and a very experienced driver from a young age, which anyone who grew up in rural America knows that's important <laughs> to get around. And she really imbued this tough, hardy Western gal um, idea. Now she attended Stanford Law School and married shortly after graduating. And after World War II, uh, when her family settled back in Arizona, she took a hiatus from law in order to care for her three young sons. Uh, she served on the presidential campaign for uh, Barry Goldwater and had connections to those grassroots efforts on the right. 
However, she was not fully embraced by them, in part because she uh, was willing to support in her time in Arizona sort of the liberalization um, of abortion laws and uh, despite her own vocal uh, reservations about it uh, and had made really strong enemies uh, among anti-choice advocates. So Phyllis Schlafly, Mildred Jefferson, uh, and people like Jerry Falwell spoke at a religious roundtable rally for life in order to uh, voice their opposition to her nomination by Ronald Reagan. But during her confirmation hearings, she was described as poised, as unintimidated, as forthright, and one Republican uh, senator said, I have tremendous respect for you as a woman who has fulfilled the indispensable roles of wife and mother and who has then gone on to professional accomplishment in pretty much an ideal format. So she was able to fulfill her, her duties as wife and mother before having the audacity to follow her own career. And this was sort of the trajectory of Phyllis Schlafly and of other advocates who um, essentially used this maternal rhetoric to say, uh, we have the right to speak on these issues. So ultimately, O'Connor would actually help uh, maintain Roe v. Wade, though in a watered down um, form. But she also, at the same time, uh, kept supporting things like the death penalty and keeping women out of battlefield combat positions. So unlike other activists, she was not as ideologically consistent or driven. So at the time, feminists frustrated with the lack of choices presented to women in education, employment, and society at large could easily be framed as saying that housework was enslavement, children are a burden, and men are the enemy. Conservative women, in contrast, strategically cast themselves as self-sacrificing mothers, protecting their children, the family unit, and therefore the nation. They could essentially come out and say, we are proud of our labor, we value our homes, and we love our children. So as this wave of anti-feminist activists reshaped the Republican Party, utilizing sort of an array of rhetorical and ideological strategies from updated maternalism, a masculine common sense, and a colorblind appropriation of civil rights, women's issues uh, sort of were at the forefront of this political realignment. And really, the movement was built on the backs of women doing this labor. Uh, and part of this came out of their ability to speak with moral authority. However, they were not always remembered as such. When we talk about female activism, we still tend to do so in terms of women on the left. And this is a problem as we move forward uh, and think about women in politics, right? So Susan Brown Miller, a radical feminist at the time, said, women as a class have never subjugated another group. We have never marched off to wars, to conquest in the name of the fatherland. Those are the games men play. We want to be neither oppressed nor oppressor nor oppressed. And just as a historian, I wouldn't call bullshit. <laughs> like Phyllis Schlafly would have nuked the world if she could. You know, like there is a real need to understand not an idealized maternal. Um, motherhood, womanhood, but instead women as real historical actors who have an array of political uh, ideas who tend to um, align themselves more closely with the men in their lives than, uh, than sort of with an ideal of women across the board. Now, I like to show this image in my class a lot. So this was a uh, sort of popular juxtaposition in 2011 that brought together sort of Obama and his mom jeans and his sneakers and his safety helmet um, against a, a photo of uh, Sarah Palin, who did attend the University of Idaho, um, on Ronald Reagan's hobby ranch. And a lot of what this sort of cultural work, this juxtaposition, juxtaposition does, is uh, sort of relays in Palin through horseback riding and uh, association with the American West, a lot of that masculine authority that many people felt uh, that President Barack Obama did not have, that he was too much, um, too feminine, too intellectual, um, and that America needed to get back to a hard line masculinity. And as we think about this today, of course, um, in the context of just the Kavanaugh hearings last week, 
uh, Newsweek ran an opinion that said, um, the Republican Party has lost women forever which once again is an ahistorical representation of who women are, right? Women were the architects of the anti-feminist, anti-choice, anti-LGBTQ movements, and therefore their uh, ideas, their ideologies, their desires often align um, with a conservative judge. And if we don't sort of reckon with this history and understand women as full political and historical actors, then there's no way in which we can um, move forward with understanding uh, moving beyond women as a monolithic category. So thank you very much. Ooh.